So, to begin with, I think the, one of the most important things to address about your work is the fact that the materials are not ones that you get in an art store. No. Talk to me about that. Um, well, I'm fascinating sort of with the history and the personality of objects. So that's where the materials came in. You know, I have this uh, whole notion that if it has more history, if it has more characteristics, then it's more valuable and more accessible. So I, I, try to, I chose to do, uh, use materials that had history. So prowling through the alleys, city dumps, that kind of thing, where people don't want. It's actually kind of like architecture for, uh, uh, archaeology for me. It's like, you know, it's interesting. So you're digging in, this is literally dumps, you're going right. to alleys, you're getting found yeah. materials that the city has left behind. Right. We can call it urban detritus, if you will. Yeah. And, and this becomes the core element that, that kind of spawns your work. Right. So that's, the found objects are the kind of the Play-Doh of your work, but then mm -hmm. talk to me about the place in which your work goes, because you don't work in a studio, you don't initially at least show in a gallery. Right. Well, initially I started sort of uh, looking, at, uh, looking at spaces and looking at abandoned buildings and looking at uh, these abandoned buildings and looking at the spaces as, as how come advertising companies can utilize these spaces, right, to advertise and to place uh, posters. Right. You know, well, X form, and it's like, what happens if we transform them? What happens if we change this, the spaces? So initially, I started out just taking debris and making structures. And then from then on, I started moving on to taking debris, going into my apartment at the time, building objects, and going into uh, abandoned buildings during the day and installing. And then when I'm one, it started getting more ambitious about what I wanted to do, how I wanted to transform the spaces. Right? Yeah. But what does it mean, though? Because the, the, the buildings you were selecting, the locations you were installing, were abandoned buildings, mm -hmm. and they were neighborhoods that were struggling. What is the, what's the significance of where you're, where you're installing the work and where you're intervening? I think there was no real, I mean, for me, there wasn't a really, a, a really deep significance to it. To me, it was really just changing the atmosphere, it was transforming the space. Right? What happens when you transform the space? How do we change how we view the space? How do we change how we interact with, an object, with, the, with the objects? What does it mean to have a playful installation of the of objects in the space that normally you wouldn't see it? To me, that was really the, the only significance to it. Yeah, I didn't you know, really have too much of a deep concept about mm -hmm. why this was happening, but I really liked sort of this transition. I came from a public art background, so I liked the idea that the work could exist in a space, like, in a space that was a public space. I liked that I can interact and create an ex, uh, accessibility with, with people, with the viewer there was a deeper connection than if you see in a museum. So then what happens when you take this work that's inherently public, mm -hmm. it's about taking an existing space with available materials and seeing how it's transformed when you intervene. What happens when you take your thinking and you put it into the four white walls of a gallery? I would change completely. I mean, when, we, when I got to, into thinking of um, exhibition, exhibitions, when I started thinking about uh, objects. Which some right. of these folks right here, these right. pieces of yours that are yeah, not are, installed in abandoned buildings, but these are. Right, these are in exhibition spaces. So what happens in an exhibition space is that I really was, I got more interested in what was happening as an event, not necessarily as, as, a, as an object, that the object could also become an event. Mm. They could become uh, an, an interactive things. So bringing what was happening in the streets, the interaction and the connectivity that was in the streets with, uh, with the viewer, with the material and the accessibility, and creating that as a form of a venue that existed within, this, within the exhibition space. So I have a question. So right. if, if the piece enters a gallery, and then in a sense, the piece provokes an event, mm -hmm. right? you bring outside, and it's happening that moment. Now, the materials are inherently not valuable in the traditional sense. No. You're using garbage, you're using... Right. So does the, does the value of the piece, are you sort of playing with that idea by making it temporal, by making it in the moment, and not something that you buy and put on your wall at your home? Right. Am I playing with the value of it? Yeah, in the sense that you can't, you can't claim your work the same way because your work is a, an event. No. I mean, I, I cannot claim it as, as, as an event because it is a structure. It's an actual functional form. Right. So it does have this combination of this, that it is temporary, right? And it creates an event. It creates a series of, of events. It creates, it transforms from space into a place, right? It creates a stage. It creates a setting. And that's the entire value to me. And this is the entire value if the object functions in another way. It can function in the same format. Which is unpurchasable, I guess right. is my point, right? It it's is. Like, like you can't, you know, you're sort of, when I say value, I mean literally right. the intrinsic right. artistic value because you're playing with time, you're playing with space. Right. I mean, it's hard to own public space, right? right? Um, 
Well, talk to me a bit about what you're doing now, because now a lot of this, this kind of evolution of this thinking from abandoned buildings to alleyways to beginning to move into the gallery takes us into some formal public spaces for CIW. Right. Talk to me about the motivation and talk to me specifically about the site. Uh, the site where, yeah. where the piece is now. That's right. Chicago Idea yeah. Week. Um, for me, uh, it's really about uh, an observation and looking at the space and looking about invisible lines of movement. Right? What happens at Pioneer Court? Right? When I was asked to produce a piece yeah. right? uh, or to submit a, a, a proposal, right. rather, I wanted it to be something that was very natural. That was very natural, that had natural movement, that had natural forms, because I was looking at the space. I was analyzing the, the, the site. Right? I was analyzing the site, and I wanted to create this object that sort of moved within this invisible lines of, 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 of progressions of people. So let's talk about that. You're analyzing the site. The site is Pioneer Square, right? right? So what, what specifically about it, what were the circumstances that motivated you to think about what, you, what did you want to highlight? What did you want to augment? What, what inspired you to intervene? Uh, I just wanted to uh, highlight and inspire me the movements. Movement. The movements of wind, the movements of people, the movements of what happens in this in this site. If you notice, I, I, if you notice the place, it's, it's constantly uh, it's a high traffic area, right? Right. There's people coming in and out of buildings as tourists go by, as people coming in and out of. And I wanted to highlight that. I wanted to highlight the fact that there was this very in this very unnatural space. There was this very natural movement. What I find interesting is that you said the word highlight invisible lines of movement. Right. You know, there's this kind of indexing you're doing, right? This, yeah. In a sense, when you go to a space like this and people are moving all around, you're getting from A to B, you're busy, you're trying not to bump someone, you have your iPad, right. iPod in your ear, but you don't realize that you are, in a sense, creating movement, a line of so forth. And I think it's interesting, especially with your gallery work, that the work was about creating an event, something that is ephemeral right. and temporal. So you have this kind of interest in the invisible in some right. ways. We see that, you have that experience where you're looking at Pioneer Square, What's the physical manifestation of your analysis? What do we, what do we find? What, what, what on earth provoked that? Well, in essence, uh, I wanted to take it from a natural construction, or something that appears naturally in, in nature, as, uh -huh. a, as a nest. As a nest. As a nest, uh -huh. right? A nest construction that later became not just a nest construction, it became a skateboard. A skateboard. A, well, not a skateboard, like a skateboard ramp, ramp a set for right. surfaces to create. So it's, it's taking this, all these ideas of movement and natural movements, right? And the ideas of creativity and the ideas of ins uh, inciting creativity and making it into an object itself. So right. we're looking at the kind of etymology of, of skateboard ramps. We're looking at bent plywood. Right. But then it sort of begins to sort of explode and move and transform. Right. So how do people want to interact with this? What's, what's the hope for that relationship? For the interaction? The interaction yeah. is very simple. The interaction is very simple. You just participate, if this is like you participate in the space already. I know it has a moment of awe, right? Because it's different, right? But really, in, in nature, it wasn't nothing. To, I wanted to highlight that, that there is two different times of space that you can transform the space by an object. There's two different times. This is a, the, the time that exists during the day, which tourists and mm -hmm. uh, and people that work downtown come, come to a space and participate with it. At the same time, that I, knowing that there's a nightlife to it. So I'm really, I was really hoping that you know, a night you could have another, another sort of set of life. Like a second existence. Like a second existence, but not really dictating what that was going to be. Right? Because the natural movements and the natural forms sort of create that sort of avenue for you to sort of be creative. And my whole idea is that I don't want to create, uh, create an object that would dictate right. Right, what you should be feeling, what you should be doing. That, it could incite that interaction. It could incite that you know, creativity for you to interact. It's not prescriptive in that right. way. You know, what I find also very interesting is that while it's, you know, it's a place, right? But it's right. also, for me, a frame through which to see the site. Right. And you know, as you walk around the site, you're going to see the architecture that frames Pioneer Square in different ways. And specifically, right. you're going to see it through curvilinear wood right. natural forms, right. which is inherently different from the rectilinear orthogonal steel and glass that's around you. I wonder what your thoughts are. Like, that's an amazing view to think about how standing at the base and looking up at the towers might transform your thinking of a square that you've walked through a zillion times. Right. But to me, it's, it's, I wanted to be, create this sort of difference, right? There is a difference right. between, the, between the architecture and the object, but I also wanted to, to be natural, mm. right? So when you look at it, it's like, yeah, it's completely different. And I think that's what the attractive element of it is, that the fact that it's wood, right, and it's recycled materials, mm -hmm. right, that that could actually create somewhat of um, 
That's the word I'm looking for. Um, a complementary form right. at the same time that it was distant. Despite that it's so different. Right. Both Despite in terms of materiality, right. both in terms of its finish right. level, both in terms of its geometry. Right. You know, I have to say, and I, I, I'm reminded a little bit of going back to New York, if you don't mind, mm -hmm looking down Fifth Avenue and thinking about the Guggenheim's Museum's relationship right. to the park and to the kind of urban muted edge of the Fifth Avenue buildings. You have these rectilinear stone turn of the century buildings and then the Guggenheim happens. Right. And in a weird way, it does what you're describing. It, it, is, it provokes contrast because it's so different in material, color, right. and geometry. But in a weird way, it kind of negotiates the park and the city and feels immediately at home. Right. And I think it's a super, frankly, it's a very complicated thing to do. And you know, as I look at that image, it seems to me that you you got, you got there. I mean, it feels arresting and yet at home at the same time. Well, I, th I think it goes back to the conversation of, you know, natural, uh, natural invisible lines. I think all these objects already exist there because they're, the elements of these objects are inherent in the space already. So it's like, it's just a matter that, that they're not really invisible. They are visible, right? And the same thing with the, the movement of the wind. Right. You know, it's like, you know, if you, if, if you uh, design an, uh, a building in terms of movement of wind. Absolutely. Right? Movement transforms, move, and wind moves a lot freely in round and and it defines the shape of the building. Defines the shape of the building. And, and I love the fact that as I look at that, I am made aware of the passage of people, right. the passage of wind in a kind of a frozen architectural way, and hopefully in a way that people who are there all the time might now pay attention to those things in a way they didn't before, right. which is kind of the highest form of art, right? To create that level of mindfulness and awareness. Yeah, exactly. Involuntary. I mean, I've always been fascinated with how do we adapt into space? Mm. How do we fill into space? How do we uh, be, how, how do we exist in this space, you know? Um, and I've taken it from a very personal point of view. I mean, I come from an area where, you know, space is not a problem, right? It's, it's, it's large, huge. And in moving from that and adapting into a city and adapting to living in Chicago, right? Space became completely different. Right. You know, it became sort of like more personal, more intimate. Right? And for me, it seems like all these works that I've been doing has been uh, somewhat of a relationship to how I translate space, and how do I think of, of private and personal space and physical space into a larger object. It is, it's, an, it's an amazing, ambitious thing, because to think about how installation art, which is in a lot of ways born in the gallery, finds its way into a public space, and is trying really hard to not, I mean, it's not, the form is so unique, and yet the intent is so much about bringing an awareness to the existing space. Right. I want you to take me there later and talk about it. To this particular piece? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Ladies and gentlemen, Juan Chavez, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Yeah.